Welcome to SBC. Welcome, Welcome to SBC. SBC. So happy you're here. Welcome, Welcome to, to SBC. SBC. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 through 13. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and one of the elders will sell you a Bible. I mean, we'll, we'll give you a Bible. <laughs> Folks, it is uh, really good to see you guys. My name is Pete. Um, we get to hang out here this morning. Welcome. Uh, welcome to, uh, to you all. Welcome to those who are watching online. Um, one of our values here at Sanger Bible is family. And as a family, um, we are called biblically to be honest with each other, to be real and authentic about our lives, 
uh, to celebrate our joys together. And so today's a, a, a joyful day. Um, if, if it were up to me, this today would be one of those days where we would have a potluck and you know just go all out and just having all sorts of food and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but as family, like we this is this, we're able to do this, and I'm so excited. Now, part of being family too is we we are called to bring sin into uh, the lot, the light out of the darkness, and so um, and so I want to begin our time today with a, a confession. Um, last week Jacob taught Matthew chapter eight verse twenty three through twenty seven. This week, we should have been teaching on verses 28 through 34, but um, because that's kind of how we do it. We, we go verse by verse. Uh, but this whole week, um, we, we prepped, I prepped the, the, the service. Um, I, we, we, me and Sean were talking about the worship music from the beginning. We talked about what's going to go before the sermon and what's going to go after the sermon. We talked about the verses and everything. And this whole time, we were prepping for next week's text. <laughs> So I realized this on Thursday, and I was like, man, it is, um, uh, it is not going to happen. I'm not going to prep uh, this week's sermon on two days. Um, and so please forgive me. We are going to do next week's text today. And then I want to encourage you, if you're first time here, or maybe you're thinking about missing next week, no, you want to come back next week because you, you got to hear Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 34. I promise you, God's word won't change by then. It always stays, never changes. Um, that is promised in his word, and that's what we believe. And so speaking of forgiveness... That is the theme for today. The, the whole heart of today's text is Matthew wants his readers to understand that Jesus forgive sins. And so when you say you are, a, uh, you are forgiven, when you say that Jesus has died on the cross for my sins, what sins have you been forgiven of? Now, as you're probably thinking, maybe I heard somebody say all or anything. Like, now, now, don't generalize it. I want to uh, specifically, what sins have God uh, forgiven you of? You don't have to say it out loud. You can just think about it in your mind. For me, one, anger. Now, that's generalized. Now, I want you to know, I get easily angered. Um, when I was young in my high school and junior high, well, started when I was four, uh, elementary, junior high, high school, college, um, fights all the time. Uh, I would have just bursts of rage. Um, I'm easily irritated. That still happens. Um, one of my other uh, uh, sins is pride. I think, and uh, at day, there's days that I believe I know it all. And because of that, I'm a control freak. And so um, there's, I, I just want to make sure, like, I, I just want to control. Everything. And when I can't control things, back in college, when I couldn't control things, I would run to alcohol. And just indulge in alcohol. And I would show up to football practice just drunk. Today, I indulge in other things. I indulge in food. And I know it's a bit funny, but at the same time, if I'm not careful, it leads to sin and I'm overeating. And I do this to suppress the feelings that I'm out of control. To make sure I don't burst out in anger. But today, I'm forgiven. In this room, if we pass around the microphone, we, I'm sure we could all, you know, confess like, oh yeah, this is what God has forgiven me. And it would be an amazing time. But before that, before we all saw Jesus, I'm sure all of our stories, all of our upbringings, we would all, it would all be different. But at some point, the one thing that is true about all of our testimonies and our stories, at some point, we all saw and understood that in Christ we are forgiven. In the beginning of Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 through 13, we're going to see the power of Jesus on display. We're going to see Jesus uh, forgive two guys. We're going to see him forgive a physically paralyzed man. We're also going to see him forgive a spiritually paralyzed man. And the, the paralyzed man is going to get up and walk away and walk home after because he's been healed. And the other man is going to follow Jesus. And in both instances, we're going to see the religious, leader, the religious leaders hating on Jesus in the back. They're going to be accusing Jesus for, for swearing to God and, and hanging out 
was sinners. Yet Matthew puts it in the gospel of Matthew to show his readers and us here today that Jesus is the Messiah that is promised to take away our sins. You see, saying the Bible, we exist to love God, love people. And so today's text is going to help you love God because we're going to see the power that Jesus has to forgive. And hopefully we will be reminded that you and I are forgiven of all of our sins. This text is also going to help us love others. You see, as forgiven people, we should be quick and fast to seeing others Not because of the sins that they live in, but because what God can do in their lives. And so this text should push us to see others the way that Jesus sees us. So that one day they will see and understand Jesus, the God who forgives. And so if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And getting into the boat, he crossed over and he came to his own city. Now, Jesus has been doing ministry on the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and now he goes back to his own city. What city is this? Is Matthew talking about? Well, we know in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We know in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, that Jesus was raised in in Nazareth. We know in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus leads Nazareth to a town called Capernaum. And Capernaum is by the sea. And this is the city that Matthew is talking about, that Jesus, that it's its own city. It's Capernaum. And so you can imagine Capernaum, they have heard of Jesus. They have heard of his power. And so look at verse 2. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now, this very same story we find in the Gospel of Mark and we find in the Gospel of Luke. And in both of those accounts, there is a bit more detail we get than in Matthew's account. Matthew's account is pretty simple. Some people brought to him a paralytic lying on the bed. There's not much there. But in Mark and Luke's account, there's a bit more detail. We know in Mark's account that the the guy is paralyzed and he has friends that brought them to Jesus. And I guess I'm assuming there's a line of people trying to see Jesus. And so they cut to the front. They climb up to the top of the house. They start uh, they start demolishing the roof, going down to the ceiling. And then they lower their friend down to Jesus where Jesus is at. That's what we find in Mark and Luke. But here in the Gospel of Matthew It's simple. Some people brought to him the paralytic lying on the bed. And look at the rest of verse 2. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Why does Matthew leave out details? We have to understand and remember why Matthew is writing this letter. Matthew is writing this letter to the Jewish people. He's writing to help them understand that Jesus is Messiah. And so the details of how the paralytic got to Jesus, it's not that big of a deal to Matthew. Why? Because he wants his readers, he wants his readers to truly see who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And what does Jesus say? Look. Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is huge. For Jesus to say, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. This implies that Jesus is God. And so you can imagine like just how the room, how how people are uh, reacting to this. You can can start kind of picturing people talking like, hey, did you hear what he said? Like he said your sins are forgiven. Hey, like, did you hear what he said? Like, who, like, who, who does he think he is? Does he, does he think he's God? He can't just forgive people's sin. He's not God. Look at the rest of verse 3. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk but that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. You see, in Mark's account, 
Jesus and the religious leaders were already in this house and the paralytic was lowered down from the ceiling to Jesus. And so the religious leaders are hearing and they're seeing all of this. And so Jesus says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And the religious leaders start bashing Jesus. Yet Jesus in verse four, knowing their hearts, he calls them out. Hey, why do you think evil in your hearts? He's saying, hey, why are you gossiping over there? Why, why are you talking smack over there? And then he asks a question, which is easier? He says, to, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk. Knowing that Jesus, uh, knowing that they can't answer and won't answer his question. What Jesus is doing here in verse 5 is he's setting them up to truly see who he is. Verse 6, it reads, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. You see, by first forgiving the sins of the man, what Jesus is doing, he is dealing with his root issue. He's dealing with, the, with his eternal salvation before he takes care of this man's earthly disability. You see, it was his eternal salvation was, was more important than this guy being able to walk. And so Jesus says, hey, your sins are forgiven. And then he commands the man to get up and walk. And by doing that, it's proving that Jesus has power. The man is healed. He's able to walk. But more importantly, he's forgiven. Just for a second, imagine if the man didn't get up. Jesus says, hey, get up and walk. And he's sitting there like trying to get up. And he doesn't. Like the crowds, people around would have been like, oh, people would start leaving. The Pharisees would have like arrogantly pronounced like, dude, this guy can't even forgive sins. He, this guy can't even walk. He's fake. Right? Like his ministry, everybody would just be talking smack because the, like he wasn't able to do this. Yet when this guy gets up and walks, it proves that Jesus has power. But even more importantly, it proves that Jesus has power to forgive. You see, Jesus' miracles back then and today are still real. The man literally gets up and goes home. And look at verse 8. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. You see, what right here we see is the power of Jesus on display. He has the omniscient power to see the scribes' hearts and to read his thoughts. He has the healing power. The paralyzed walks home. But above those two, he has the power to forgive. And that's what Matthew wants us to understand here this morning. That's what we should walk away with the text here this morning. Sure, you know, I'm, you know, if we were teaching Mark or teaching another, the gospel, whatever the focus was, we'll focus on that. Sometimes we, we teach this text. I've heard a, a pastor teach this text in Matthew, and then he focused so much on the friends that brought the paralytic, which I get, it makes sense. But in Matthew's account, he is trying to help his readers understand who Jesus is. He wants us to understand that Jesus has the power and the authority over sins. And so we saw this as he physically, um, you know, healed the paralyzed man and he forgives him of his sin. Now we're going to see in verses 9 through 13, we're going to see a man spiritually paralyzed. And Jesus is going to call him to follow him. Verse 9. As Jesus passed on him from there, passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Matthew is a Jew, and his job is to be a tax collector, and so he's at this booth working. Now, just to give us an understanding, Matthew, to his family, to his friends, to his culture, Matthew was considered a traitor. You see, tax collectors, they worked for the enemy. They worked for the Roman government. And so as he worked collecting taxes, like he was around people, tax, uh, tax collectors during those times, they were greedy, grimy guys who just wanted to lie, steal, and sell, just anything to get money in their pockets. 
And so they would like literally black, uh, blackmail people just to get more money. And so because of that, like the culture, everybody was like, dude, like we don't want nothing of you. They didn't want nothing of you. They would just scam people. And so because of their scamming people, it created animosity. These guys were hated. And so they became outcasts in their culture. They were even disqualified from being a witness in any kind of court session. They were excommunicated from the synagogue. They were no longer recognized as a family uh, with the extended, uh, in their extended family. They were, so they, they were just kind of almost kicked out because of their shame and disgrace. So it literally means they were a nobody. They weren't accepted in their culture. They weren't accepted in their community. They couldn't practice their faith. They couldn't practice their faith, especially in their culture, where faith and the culture and community, everything went together. And so this guy was spiritually paralyzed. And so he's sitting at his booth. And I'm assuming he heard of Jesus before. I'm assuming he's heard the stories of Jesus and how this rabbi is healing people and this rabbi is calling people to follow him. I'm assuming all this. It doesn't say in the text. And then he rolls up to the tax booth. And Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, follow me. And so just keep, think about Matthew, where you're at. Matthew, if, if you're Matthew, you're sitting there. Everybody else in your life is say, hey, get lost. Get away from me. Your family say, hey, get away from me. Your culture says, hey, you're no longer part of this culture. The synagogue, the very place where you would go pray and all this and give up your sacrifices. They say, you can't even come anymore. And then uh, rolls up Jesus and says, hey, follow me. He does. He leaves everything behind. And he follows Jesus. Now, just think with me for a little bit. When Jesus goes up to, to Matthew, he's also walking up to Matthew with his disciples, the fishermen. Think about the fishermen, where they're at. The fishermen probably know Matthew, and they know him well. Why? Because Matthew's the text collector who probably texts every single fish that they caught. So they probably hated each other. Like, the fisherman was like, nah, dude, like, well, well, time out. Why, why are you calling that guy to follow us? So you could just imagine the tension, like the drama, the conversations or the lack of conversations that were happening there. And so this is, this is who Jesus is literally calling. He's calling the fishermen who nobody wants. They can't even, they can't even follow any rabbis anymore. Why? Because they they're weren't good enough. And then Jesus calls the tax collector. Oh, man, that's like just if you step back, step back and look. Jesus is literally calling everyone that nobody wants. Look at verse 10. Jesus reclines at the table in the house. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came, were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. It's probably safe to say that they're at Matthew's home or Matthew's residence or some sort of like tax collector's residence. But that doesn't matter because what matters is Jesus is now eating with those who are outcasts, those who were the excommunicated those who are disqualified, like Jesus is literally chilling there with some hummus and pita bread, you know, <laughs> having some juice, just hanging out with sinners. Like he's hanging out with the tax collectors. He's hanging out with people nobody wants to hang out with. And look who notices, verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, then he says in verse 13, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Pharisees are hating on Jesus for Jesus doing exactly what he came here to do. Jesus left heaven to, to come to a, a, a earth full of sinners. And now he is living out what he's all about, eating in a sinner's home. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they're, they're, they're kind of outside. They're, they're too good. 
They're the doctors who, who want nothing to do with sick people. They're the doctors who, who only want to be with healthy people. They're the doctors who are like, hey, only if you think like me and have the same values, you can come and be with me. There are those kind of doctors. They're on their high horse, their righteous high horse. Sure, they want people to be healed. Sure, they want the, the sinners to be forgiven, but only from afar. Like they wouldn't even do a meal with these guys. Yet here is the king, the Christ, the Messiah. He's having dinner with them. He's here for the sick and the sinners. And so Jesus quotes Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 to them. In verse 13, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, in Hosea's day, they had the acts. They had the rituals. They had everything down. But they had lost their love. Like the, the Ephesus, the Ephesians church. They had forsaken mercy. They had been abandoned mercy. Like they had all everything ready and good to go. But because they lost their knowledge of God and truth, they fell into a mundane routine. Jesus quotes this Hosea to the Pharisees because they were doing the same. They had the, the dress, they acted right, they had all the rituals, but they just weren't good. They didn't have mercy. They were arrogant, prideful people, completely missing the point. And here, Jesus shows his heart and how he came for the sick, the sinners, the outcasts, excommunicated, the disqualified. He came for you. He came for you. He came for all of us. And in him, you and I are forgiven of our sins. As he forgave the paralytic, as he forgave uh, the, uh, Matthew, we are forgiven of our past sins, our current sins, and our future sins. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. As much as you're wrestling right now, you're like, yeah, people, you don't know my addictions. You're forgiven in your drug addiction. You're forgiven in your alcohol addiction. You're forgiven in your dirty mouth. You're forgiven with your lies. Everything that you have ever stolen, you're forgiven of. You're forgiven of your sexual immorality, sex out of marriage, pornography, same sex, masturbation, lust. Yes, you're forgiven. And yes, we said it. We're forgiven of these sins. We're forgiven of pride, arrogance, materialism, money, status. You have been forgiven. Just fill in the blank. You have been forgiven. We've been forgiven. Even the sins that, that are committed to you that has caused you to be angry and to rage and to carry unforgiveness, you have been forgiven. And even the sins that were committed to you that cause you to walk around with shame, embarrassment, guilt. In his forgiveness, Jesus takes away the burdens, those burdens of those sins, and he carries them. You are forgiven. Not because of anything we did, because of what he did. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, we are made new. In Christ, we are no longer sinners of this world. We are now saints. We're now saints. We are blood-bought, forgiven sinners who now have a new life in Christ and now call saints. Romans chapter 8 Chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our backstories, our upbringings, all of it, all of our stuff is different. Yet the one reason why we are sitting here today, the one common storyline among all of us is we can and all say 
this is when I saw Jesus for the first time clearly that he died for my sins and that I'm forgiven. Back in 97, I was a sophomore in high school. I've told this story many times, but it's the story that keeps on coming clearly to, to just uh, bring home and for us to understand what forgiveness truly looks like in our day today. But in 97, I got moved up to varsity football, and uh, because of that, there were some guys who were jealous. Um, and so uh, before the first game of the season, the Thursday before the first game of the season, I walk on the school campus and I get jumped. So I got jumped by four guys. Um, my, this, my left ear was hanging, I was bleeding, um, everywhere. Um, and so I remember I was like, it was the beginning of school. I just picked myself up, walked back home. Remember I opened up the door and my mom just screaming cause my face is all covered in blood. And so she's screaming and then my dad said, calm down. So we sit down and like, they get me all ready. So I'm thinking I'm chilling the rest of the day, you know, but my dad never does anything the way people would naturally think of things. He was like, wait, what, what are you doing? I was like, um, you know, no, he was like, no, you're going to school. So, all right. So I, I go to school. Obviously, I went on, gla- on glasses. It's the talk of the school. Like, everyone's talking about it. And like, you're back. What are you doing? And then, you know, the next day, um, we play the football game. I'm playing the football game. You know, I was, had to be careful taking my helmet off or else the rest of my ear would come off, all that stuff. But I'm, I'm telling this story because within a year's span, the guy that led the, the, the other guys to, to jump me, I remember one day my dad's like, hey, get in the car. We're going to go to Joe's house. His name's Joe Casey. And so thinking like, yeah, man, Woo, my dad's going to handle business. Now we get there and my dad gets out of the car. My dad invites him to church. Within a year span of me getting jumped um, and him inviting uh, Joe to church, Joe got baptized by my dad. And so I tell you this story because my dad lived a life before he came to Christ. Man, he was reckless. Like they, they, he, I, I go to Tongan places and people be like, your dad's Sifa? I'm like, yeah. He was like, oh, let me tell you some stories. I've heard more stories about my dad and what he's done in the past when I go and talk to other people. And yet when they find out he's a Christian and now he does what he does, my dad was able to forgive the very guy who led three other guys to jump his son. Man, if somebody touched my family, I did not know what I would do. But to forgive, I can only know that's because of the Holy Spirit. And that can only make sense because my dad understands that he was forgiven at the foot of the cross. He was forgiven. Church, there is a world out there that needs us to proclaim the power of Jesus to forgive. And so whatever sins that you're coming in and you're carrying, that you're holding on to right now, you are forgiven at the foot of the cross. Jesus died so that we would be forgiven, so that we wouldn't walk around with all these burdens and sins, that we would be free, not free to do whatever, free to tell the world about Jesus at the foot of the cross, that everybody's forgiven. My dad laid aside his pride, his pride to make things even. He laid aside his pride because the gospel meant more to him. He laid aside his pride because it meant more to him for one person to come to Christ than for him to get even. I don't know what you're walking around with. I don't know what sins you carry. I don't know what burdens you walk with. But I do know Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, we, we are forgiven. Let's pray. Father, your love is it's it's amazing. It's clear in how much you love us. We we can't even fathom how much you love us that you would send your son to walk this earth, 
And today we read in Matthew's account and what Matthew saw, the power that Jesus has to forgive. Everybody was, it had been in awe of him healing people. And that's amazing that, that there's miracles that still happen today. But the ultimate miracle is that he healed the paralytic man. He healed Matthew. Now Matthew follows you, uh, you Jesus, and that we are here today because the greatest miracle of all, that we sinners are now alive in you, Jesus Christ. So I pray this morning that that rings true in our hearts and our minds. Pray that the soil that the seed fell on here this morning is good soil. Pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.
accepted by the power of your love my every stain is washed away and I am for